where do we stand today? There is truth to the phrase, follow the money. Today's headlines scream warnings about the current economic crisis, both in the U.S. and around the world. Our situation is much worse than most people realize. How did we get to this point? The answer is twofold. First, the U.S. dollar's loss of more than 95% of its purchasing power over the last 100 years. And second, the greed, power lust, and incompetence that caused that loss. Because he who fails to learn from history is forever doomed to repeat it, let's peer down the well-worn path that has led countries, kingdoms, and empires to ruin time and again. The U.S. dollar generally held its value during the first century and a half of our country's existence, dipping down only when the government issued fiat legal tender money, mainly during times of war. While firmly tethered to sound money, the dollar has always retained its purchasing power. The same is true of many great societies and cultures throughout history. The Greek drachma, Roman denarius, and British pound each kept their value intact for over three centuries. By all accounts, the Byzantine bezant holds the record as the longest-running inflation-proof currency in history, having circulated for at least 800 years. However, human nature as it is, the elite found it hard to resist helping themselves by stealth to the people's wealth. One early ploy, coin clipping, involved recasting new coins from gold and silver shaved from the edges of coins already in circulation. When reeded, ribbed edged coins were introduced to discourage this practice, a new scheme came into vogue. Governments simply diluted each coin's precious metal content by mixing in cheap base metals. In 54 AD, a Roman denarius was 94% silver. By 218 AD, that percentage had dropped to 43%. Only 50 years later, it had fallen to less than 1%. During this sad era, a Roman merchant either became adept at discerning weak from full-strength coins by their feel, smell, and even taste, or quickly went out of business. So today, when the price of gold or silver goes up, really, the value of the dollar is dropping. Sound money does not inflate. The same gold piece that would have bought the latest tunic, toga, and sandals in Roman times will purchase a finely tailored suit, overcoat, and patent leather shoes today. Who benefits by inflation? Ironically, those who created the problem in the first place, central banks and governments. Having first dibs on newly printed money allows them to make their purchases before prices rise as a result of the expanded money supply. Modern day coin clipping occurs at the printing press. The inflation tax slice of the people's pie goes to the Fed and to growing government. They cut each slice away slowly and carefully over many years, hardly perceptible, that is until there's nothing left to steal. It's like we're all victims of a slow motion bank robbery so slow that few notice what's going on. But now the heist is almost complete, and we the people's vault of prosperity is just about completely emptied. Let me issue and control a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. That was said by Meyer Amschel Rothschild of the worldwide Rothschild banking dynasty, a likely shareholder in the privately owned secretive Federal Reserve banking system. In 1913, Congress granted the Federal Reserve monopoly power over the entire U.S. monetary system on the promise of perpetual prosperity. Funny that we seem to have had nothing but perpetual booms, busts, and boondoggles ever since. Our founding fathers witnessed firsthand the devastation of fiat paper currencies. During the Revolutionary War, Congress inflated the money supply by 5,000%. It's not like fiat currency and central banking is a new idea. The ink was barely dry on the Constitution when ambitious men combined to establish America's first central bank. Today's Federal Reserve is actually the fourth central bank in our country's history, but the first three were short-lived because the people fought back against the predictable misery they produced. Andrew Jackson literally staked his presidency and his life on bringing down America's third central bank. It was a hard-fought battle. He railed, 
You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the eternal God, I will. He warned the people against the foreign control of America's money supply that central banks always seem to bring. Is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that in its nature has so little to bind it to our country, almost wholly owned by the subjects of a foreign power? Surviving an assassination attempt, Jackson lived to see that bank closed and sound money restored to America. A hundred years ago, America slipped into a dream. We roused a bit from the stir John F. Kennedy caused by calling for debt-free silver certificates to replace debt-backed Federal Reserve notes. But when he was silenced at the grassy knoll, we fell back into our trance and hardly noticed when Johnson replaced the silver coins with cheap tokens the very next year. I suppose we can take some consolation from Henry Ford who said, it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. So here we stand atop a mountain of debased and crumbling currency. Aroused from our stupor, we find ourselves teetering at the edge of a financial precipice made all the more precarious by a president who in the first eight months of office created more new money than all his predecessors combined. So what's down there at the bottom of the abyss? The numerous historical examples of destructive monetary policies based on unsound fiat legal tender share many troubling consequences alternating rampant inflation and deflation, heavy taxation, unemployment, civil unrest, rioting, revolution, governmental coups, and war. For example, Zimbabwe exhibited many of these ills during its recent hyperinflationary spiral, which lasted from the early 2000s through April 2009. At that point, the government finally gave up printing the Zimbabwean dollar, allowing the South African rand and US dollar to fill the void. That decade in Zimbabwe witnessed unemployment rates reaching as high as 94%, price controls enforced by the arrest of non-compliant shopkeepers, empty supermarket shelves, and dwindling gasoline supplies. At its peak in December 2008, the annual inflationary rate in Zimbabwe topped 6.5 quindecillion novemdecillion percent. That is 65 followed by 107 zeros percent. Possibly the most tragic example of hyperinflation resulted in World War II, which had a worldwide death toll of over 54 million people, the bloodiest war of all time. So how did Hitler happen? It can be argued that World War II was set in motion years earlier, at the moment the order was given to turn on the printing presses. The reason? After World War I, the German economy lay in shambles. With its economy struggling and its citizens starving and heavy war debts to repay, Germany started printing large quantities of paper German marks as fast as they could. Their goal seemed reasonable. They wanted to stimulate the weak German economy and simultaneously pay off their war debts. Sound familiar? They needed more money, so they simply printed it. The faster they printed, the faster the value went down. This caused the value of the German mark to collapse, and economic disaster followed as hyperinflation exploded. Weimar Germany experienced one of the greatest inflations in modern history. Eventually, the official exchange rate reached 4.2 trillion marks per dollar. Some Germans heated their homes by burning cash, since it was cheaper than buying actual wood. Others had to use wheelbarrows to carry enough money to buy food. As things got worse, people were paid three times a day. Occasionally, piles of money were left behind by thieves who preferred stealing the more valuable wheelbarrow rather than the money it held. People were thrown out of work and left starving. The hungry resorted to desperate means just to stay alive. Many women reverted to prostitution just to feed themselves and their children. In this climate of desperation and starvation, Hitler rose to power, becoming a messiah figure who promised to save Germany and restore her morality and pride. Having done that, he led the German people in a quest to save the rest of the world, by force if necessary. What should we learn about the importance of good monetary policies from this? Everything. 
lives and freedom hang in the balance. There is much truth to the saying, money is the root of all evil. So where do we stand today? On November 3rd, 2010, Fed Chair Ben Bernanke unveiled a plan to frantically pile more and more dollars on the crumbling cliff edge. The Fed plans to crank up printing presses and pump $600 billion more dollars into the economy over the next 18 months. This on top of the $2.3 trillion brand new dollars created since 2008, with no visible effect on our languishing economy. All of this in an effort to create yet another bubble that will simply pop down the road, creating more misery and financial woes for the American people. Given these kinds of solutions, the worst is certainly yet to come. Throughout history, wherever people have embraced sound money, prosperity has followed. So contact your Utah State Representative and Senator. Let them know that it's time for Utah to pull the ripcord on the golden parachute the framers carefully prepared for us. Because the Founding Fathers knew by their own experience the dangers of unbacked fiat money, they packed our golden parachute with great care. They provided in Article 1, Section 8, for Congress to regulate commerce between states, not within them. In Section 10 of Article 1, they made sure that no state would make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Also in the Bill of Rights, they reminded us that powers not delegated to the United States nor prohibited to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The Utah Sound Money Act is being circulated to your elected official for their review and support. Your Utah State Senator and Utah House Representative need to know you support this bill. Utah friends, please beware. Powerful moneyed interests and their allies at the highest levels of government will always oppose sound money. But do you really want to trust your family's lives to a parachute packed by the same people who pushed you off the cliff in the first place? Don't look to Washington to save the day. We must choose to save ourselves. Pull the ripcord, now. Call your legislators today and tell them to pass the Utah Sound Money Act so Utah can pull the ripcord and float to safety. The www.utahsoundmoney.org website provides easy help to find your elected officials' contact information. Here you can also learn more about the bill and the constitutional basis for its success. Sound money rings true. Thank you.